So some years ago, um, the Association for Progressive Communication, APC, did actually bring together a group of feminists and people working on digital rights to discuss what could be principles of a feminist internet. And you can go and look at them in detail. There are 17 of them uh, on feministinternet.org is the website. Uh, but they roughly are also in certain buckets of ideas, uh, access, something that has been touched on over and over again. We know that we don't have, that the feminist principle is that people should have access, that access should be affordable, it should not be curtailed, and so on. It should be an access to information and the ability to use the internet easily. Um, and should be uh, access to information in, uh, the, with diversity in mind. So diversity of languages, the internet should not be only for English speaking people, for example, um, or only Western countries. Uh, movements is the other area of set of principles are around the idea of movements, the right to organize uh, a principle which brings people together in protest or also to express their own needs uh, and their political understandings. Uh, another area clusters around the idea of economy. So the fact that the internet should be affordable for people, that it should be open source, and that in fact, it should not be constrained completely and totally by homogenous idea of what markets are, or completely corporate control to put it more simply. Um, the other cluster of principles is around the idea or theme of expression, that we should be able to amplify our realities. And in a way, uh, a lot of what um, um, Isha Chitnis and Khabar Leheria spoke about, that our ability to talk about our realities on our terms in our voices is something that amplifies our realities. But it also is something that Neha Dikshit touched upon, I think, in her presentation when she said that there needs to be more ground reporting so that realities of diverse people are amplified. And I'll speak about this a little bit more once I've gone over the principles in general. Um, it's also, of course, as Bishakha said in her presentation, the idea of sexuality actually threads through many of these ideas of expression, of curtailment, where gender is concerned, uh, of talking about our realities, of diversity, of intersectionality as well. Um, and that the feminist principles of the internet, it should be remembered and not only about women, as we understand it very traditionally, but women and queer persons, and, when, and gender in its many, many diverse expressions and choices. Um, it also, under the idea of expression, feminist principle of the internet, reject the label of harmful content. And so something I will just uh, talk about at more length, but what does this harmful content idea mean? And is it helpful uh, in a feminist sense or actually harmful to others? And last of all, the idea of embodiment, uh, where the internet is often seen as a disembodied space, not a real space in which we can more or less do anything we want, which we wouldn't do in what we call IRL or real life. And I also want to propose the idea that maybe we should stop saying online and offline and start saying internet and outer net because in a sense, the internet is inside our lives and sometimes we're inside it and sometimes we're outside it. But the two things, the online and the offline are actually interwoven because they're, they're dynamically impacting each other, which when other panelists have continuously spoken about how we can't look at it just by itself, but there's an entire holistic understanding of culture and politics and society that must go into the way we talk about the internet. In a sense, what we are saying is that the online and the offline dynamically impact each other. It's not that only culture impacts technology. Technology also impacts culture. So we have to continuously think of both alongside. So the internet and the outer net, I'm saying for now. But also ideas like consent, anonym, anonymity, the voices of young people, um, the idea of violence, all of these get in, discussed under the thematic of embodiment so i would say that you know rather than going into listing it uh i would say that people should go in and have a look at these principles i think they're interesting for us to re revisit over and over again um and i'm going to only uh, touch on a, uh, some points that i think uh, this idea of feminist principles helps us to think about i think thus far we've discussed the idea of representation the idea of gender as something that is underrepresented and it's not powerful enough, or diversity as something that remains on the margins, whereas the center is kind of, the normative center is often overwhelmingly male, upper caste, heterosexual, et cetera, right? But I, I'm, I want to ask us to maybe think now in feminist terms about the work we do, which we call feminist, and whether it's always necessarily adhering to feminist principles, or sometimes 
because the internet is constraining us more and more in different ways, we may not sometimes realize when we ourselves are not furthering our own principles, let me say, right? So I think like one of the important things that we often forget um, is that technology is not a solution. It is a resource. And that is why all the questions that are laid out in the principles of access and so on become so important in just the way as when we talk about access to other resources, education or land, water, air, clean air, et cetera, et cetera. There are dozens of resources that all citizens have the right to that we're always fighting for. And it's important that we think of the internet as a resource and not a solution, which I think over and over again, we find that we do. I'm going to step back from the internet because I'm that old that I have had a full adult life before there was internet. Uh, and I want to talk about the idea of technology as always being brought up in this way, right? So for instance, when video came into being, it was, there was an excitement about, oh, now we'll have video cameras. So we will tell our own stories in our own voices, so on and so forth. And there were a number of, number of initiatives like Video Seva or the initiatives in DDS, a tech and development society which put technology into the hands of to tell their own stories. But I think that there's a lot to learn from going back and looking at those. I do think that the internet, because it is far less in, it's, it's less controlled in some ways, it's more untidy and that's its great good quality, right? So that if I decide to, uh, if I create a handle like uh, uh, Adivasi Lives Matter, or even if I create a handle like Queer Muslim Project, say, there is a kind of combination of identities and desires that is present in that evocation. So I think that uh, there's something to be learned about how when people are able to express themselves easily, when they have the access to the resource, that expression is not politically normative either. Like they may want to do many things which don't make people comfortable and which don't easily tick a politically correct box. And that I think is quite important. But in the past, when people thought about technology as liberatory, they always meant it only in a good way, right? Like much in the way that education or the idea that if girls are educated, they will become good girls. Whereas if girls are sexually expressive, well, that's not a good freedom to have, right? So these, these kind of moral, this moral valence that comes about when we think about technology as a solution is something to keep in mind, I feel. Uh, and I think we all often do forget it. And I think especially because the temptations of scale are so great, we are tempted into thinking of technology as a solution rather than a resource. Uh, and that also makes us pretty lazy, right? So uh, some of, uh, I would also say that we should think about the history of feminist paternalism, which, is, which interlaces with the idea of intersectionality. But I think when we look back at so many feminist uh, interventions around, especially pornography, sexuality, image making, representation of women in the media, we find that there have been numerous censorious kinds of movements, right? Like there have been times when you want to blacken posters, but many of those things have ended up being censorious of sexual expression themselves. And I think that we should be careful not to repeat those kinds of moral tendencies in what we do, right? So in a feminist internet, and if we think about people in terms of desire, not in terms of need alone, what they wish to do as much as what they might need, that actually allows us to think in a more heterogeneous, heterogeneous way about sexual expression as well. Um, I think it helps us not to fall into problems of progressive moral panics. I'm going to give you some quick examples of those. So for example, uh, the Creep Kavali, which was very popular uh, as an internet, internet video, and it uh, touched on ideas of unwanted sexual advances online, uh, but what it ended up doing is creating this kind of demonized figure of uh, an other man who can't speak English properly. So then it was coded in terms of caste and class to say that the man who is allowed to make a pass at you has to be perhaps of your own caste and class. But another type of man is in your other's inbox. So all of this kind of coded communication, which is inherently protectionist, while seeming to be, protecting women from violence is something I think to be very mindful of. We have also seen boys locker room leading to a similar kind of an outcry about control and punishment, which is like, you know, the boys should be sent to jail or whatever, rather than thinking about the larger world of uh, young people 
and what kind of sexual expression and sex education they have access to. Uh, which all of these are what I would call progressive moral panics. They seem to be caring about the well-being of people while promoting the idea of censoriousness. Um, and I think um, TikTok is another example that we should look at because we did see, I mean, forget about the government banning TikTok. I, I, I will put it in a separate box. But before that, we did see a number of, um, you know, like elite kind of news outlets talking about the misogyny on TikTok. Uh, which is cherry picking TikTok, right? You will take four or five videos which may be misogynist and then say the whole of TikTok is misogynist. But what is TikTok? It is an app that was majorly used by working class people, by people in rural areas. It was in fact rambunctious. It was very, very polyphonic sexually. Uh, it was messy and it was not at all what I like to call bhadralok, like it was not respectable politics respectable sexual politics also exists where we mandate certain sexual expression as respectable and open and then that which doesn't fit into our comfortable categories we say oh this is somehow disrespectful of women or it's misogynist so you don't hear people saying youtube is misogynist although misogyny is readily available on youtube you do not hear anybody saying instagram nobody said ban instagram at the time that the boys locker room inc incident happened right but you immediately want to call out TikTok, an entire app. So I think we should be mindful when we do critiques uh, of how we are constituting certain things and how that is not actually intersectional in our approach, right? So the intersectionality beyond thinking only about representation, which is extremely important, but to also think of how it is, how our expression of censoriousness is sometimes coded in class and caste and religious terms. Uh, lastly, I know I'm running out of time. So um, I think that the idea of uh, a corporate controlled internet because we are increasingly when we say internet we often mean social media we don't just mean access to the digital but we mean what is happening on social media and i think that here um, we get tempted by the formats that are available to us uh, we could often be in danger of being tempted by what social media platforms present to us as political success, as creative success, as cultural success, right? So for example, uh, the hashtag becomes something very compelling for us. We feel that it's a way to get numbers and numbers equal to visibility. But what is it that we sacrifice when we are searching for that visibility? Is it worth the trade-off? Are we mindful of the trade-off? I think these are some feminist questions to talk about. Uh, does it allow us to create new forms? The belief that the form is not politically loaded, but that content is content is political, but form is apolitical, which is what, in a sense, uh, uh, the idea that we are continuously saying content producing, content creator, and we are not questioning where is that content going, right? And that it is falling into the bucket of the form that is available to us, and which, as Anya brought up earlier, is you know there is owned by certain corporates who are often beyond any kind of accountability from us. So I think it's something to be mindful of that can we create as creators? And I would say because I'm a creative professional, I think about this a lot. And I do believe that as creative people or as people working with culture, we can create formats even within the structure of the internet, which defy the homogenizing of the internet. And you know, at least on Agents of Ishq, our effort is to work against the clickbaiting, the hashtag virality, the tendency of how virality makes us tell only certain types of stories in certain types of ways about certain types of ideas. Um, and I think that uh, in whatever we do, we should consider certain conundrums, right? There will always be some contradictions that emerge. For example, I will take the idea of anonymity, which is part of the feminist principle of the internet, which is very valuable to us. We would like to have the right to anonymity for a number of reasons. We also understand that anonymity uh, can be used to be violent. I mean, we see it all the time with trolling, that trolling becomes a way to, anonymity becomes a way to wreak complete havoc uh, on people's lives. So before we are very quick to ask for some kinds of censorious and protective measures, we do need to consider whether those are measures that will lead to greater surveillance of queer people, women, trans people, etc. Because traditionally, when people ask for protectionist things, it has always led to greater surveillance. So I think in the campaigns that we run, in the campaigns that we promote, 
I think there needs to be some mindfulness about whether the idea of protection should be so very strongly culturally built in. And whether the idea of protection does not always privilege a privileged identity, right? that there is a respectability politics of purity, that women should not ever be looked at sexually, which also creates a lot of like it loses a nuance when we start talking about sexual harassment, when we talk about Me Too, when we talk about all of these other extremely urgent and important expressions uh, of uh, women's sexual experience, negative. Uh, and their desire to talk about the sexism that they have faced via sexual harassment, uh, which are which are important, but should not lead us to then immediately ask for protectionist approaches or censorious approaches, uh, because those would in a way contradict our feminist principles and perhaps reduce the space rather than expand the spaces which we imagine will give us mobility. So I think that's the real value of looking at the feminist principles of the internet using them as a way to think about the work that we ourselves do. Will it expand our space or will it reduce our space? Even though on the surface, it seems to be arguing for greater safety and mobility for women and queer persons. Um, and uh, I think that also because of the, the pull of virality, the pull of numbers, the pull of scale, it's important to remember that we too could become normative very easily because the more we we search for that political expression, our politics and our expression could become tend towards normativeness rather than expressiveness or multiple experientialities and heterogeneous expressions. Um, and that we can, we can very easily fall into what the internet privileges, which is uh, critiquing somebody else rather than centralizing what we wish. Uh, that, and I think that that's a very important distinction that we, uh, we should not spend all our feminist energy uh, only critiquing the patriarchy and demanding a change, but actually expressing feminism and changing the world through various feminist expressions, uh, shifting the paradigm through those feminist expressions is something that we want to privilege over only addressing and centralizing it.